Mike, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay in the back? I just want to make sure we monitor sound. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's, the year has gone by very fast, and we're very pleased to give a report on our health system. Um, I'm going to speak for a little bit and talk about some national trends and what's happening as an update to the health reform. Stan Froschwag, Dr. Froschwag, is going to talk a little bit about inside the hospital and what's happening with our medical staff and our care, and then I'll conclude with uh, an update on our health system. So national health reform, uh, of course, uh, the law was passed in 2010. It was implemented. The Affordable Care Act was implemented in 2014, and its effect is still uh, pretty far-reaching. Uh, we have... Um, Trying to get, excuse me. So I'm going to cover what's happened uh, with um, at the federal level, the state level, patient impact, and then the, the provider impact. Providers include physicians and hospitals. So the impact in the federal government, um, among the reasons that the Affordable Care Act was enacted, is that the costs, the deficit spending at the federal level was so great. Uh, that the Medicare program would likely uh, go insolvent by 2017, and that's just next year. And so we could not sustain that cost, the amount of revenue coming in from taxes and the expenditures for the Medicare program and the Medicaid program, we call it Medi-Cal in California, was too much. And you can see that beginning, uh, we had some, some surplus years uh, in the early 2000s, and then by 2009, the deficit reached um, an unacceptable level, and that continued. There was a hope that the Affordable Care Act would get us back to a point where it would be neutral, but um, we're spending still more than uh, what we're, we're taking in, so we still have a projected deficit. And for the Medicare Trust Fund, um, the date, as I said, in 2009, had we continued to spend at that level revenues from taxes versus expenses to hospitals, physicians, the trust fund would go bankrupt, would become insolvent in 2017. While the deficit is still there, the insolvency has been pushed off till 2030. And obviously, it's not going to um, uh, explode. We uh, don't want to be alarmists here some other program or some other steps would have to take place to prevent the Medicare program from going insolvent. The reason for this, as you can see, health care expenditures in the dark blue, at least my eyes, it says dark blue. I hope yours says the same thing, versus the orange. Orange represents the gross domestic pro product per capita, and the blue represents the uh, national health expenditures per capita. And you can see for every era, for every decade, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and so forth, healthcare expenditures has outpaced uh, the rest of the economy. And that projection is still the case as we go forward. Some argue that this is unacceptable. Some say that, well, there's nothing more important than our health, so why not spend more money on our health and welfare? But from an economic standpoint, this is really the challenge. Uh, this next slide also shows that after the Affordable Care Act was passed, Medi-Cal and Medicaid has increased, and obviously the uninsured has gone down. There are some uh, parts of our expenditures, and the result of that, because there's, there's been an expansion of Medicaid, that is significantly added to the government's burden for health care. And so we have fewer uninsured individuals and more now on the rolls. One in three uh, Californians now has Medicaid insurance. Some of the expenditures are really outstripping the rest of the thing, and I'll, I'll share another slide or two on this. But pharmaceutical spending, uh, compared to the rest of the country, uh, all the other countries, is significantly higher, and we, um, we use a lot more medications. Uh, Medicare now represents 14% of every nickel the go federal government spends. It's on Medicare and nine cents for Medicaid. That's going to increase. And as it increases, it, the, the pie reshapes and therefore there's less money 
for defense, for Social Security, for other expenditures. And so this is why this remains a hot political um, battle. You'll hear candidates for both state and national offices talking about the need to abolish Obamacare or to keep it. There's various opinions on this. And the effectiveness of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, you'll see from uh, some surveys, it really goes down party lines whether someone likes it or does not like it. Um, this just shows, again, it puts that into perspective that the, uh, the actual and projected um, annual growth in Medicare uh, per capita is still going to be high, but it has started to slow down. And uh, we have um, uh, the actual from 2010, 2014, the projected spending is going to be higher than that. We did have a little bit of period when the Affordable Care Act was first implemented that spending slowed down. But now it's starting to heat up again, and it's heating up at a pace of about 4.1%. The Affordable Care Act um, has bent the cost curve. That was one of the questions before it was enacted. This light blue line represents, uh, based, based on some March 2010 data, of what healthcare spending would do. In January of last year, the, the curve bent and in March of last year at further bent. While it hasn't um, made a flat line, it has slowed down the rate of healthcare expenditures. And as I said earlier, the number of uh, uninsured has really gone down to about 12.9% uh, today. So we still have 12.9%, uh, 13% of everyone who lives in the United States does not have health insurance. So the Affordable Care Act did not provide health insurance for everyone um, like other countries have, England and Germany and Switzerland and so forth. We still have nearly 13% uh, um, of the population without health insurance. Now the impact in California, you, of those who came last time, I had this uh, very busy slide. This just shows the what was called the health care exchange. Uh, the law says that you either have to have insurance through your employer or through the government, like Medicare, or you have to go to the exchange, and if you don't do so, you will have to pay a penalty. So um, uh, a, an individual in California would come to a computer, and they would enter information on their projected income uh, for the upcoming year. For those that... Uh, whose income is very modest at about 300% or lower the federal poverty guideline, they would qualify for Medi-Cal and receive free health care. Those that have modest income but below or, or above the threshold for Medicaid, they will receive premium tax, uh, they'll, they'll receive um, um, uh, cost, uh, excuse me, um, tax waivers, and part of their health care premium will be paid by the government uh, when they file their income tax. And then finally, the rest of everybody has to pay the full fare. About 87% of those who go to the exchange either get Medicaid or have a, um, a tax credit uh, through their income tax. Once that's done, an individual selects between the, the bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. Bronze is the uh, lowest premium with the highest deductible, and platinum is the highest premium and the lowest deductible. About 73% of individuals choose the silver plan. Uh, that seems to be the sweet spot for most people. And these are the plans that um, are available in our community. And once uh, you select that plan, you then sign up and you're issued a certificate of insurance. And the federal government is also notified electronically that you have now purchased the insurance as required by the Affordable Care Act. If somebody does not choose to do so, they have to pay a penalty in their income tax and they're without insurance. Is that clear? Did I explain that well enough? Um, so in California now, it has really worked. In 2013, before um, the law was enacted, we had 22% of Californians without insurance, and now it's down to 13%.
one in three uh, Californians have Medicaid insurance. And that means it is the largest health plan in California. So the state government and the way Medicaid works, half of the premium is paid by the state government, half of it is paid by the federal government. But this has increased the cost burden on both the federal and the state. So um, I'm going to transition now to impact on patients. Have outcomes improved? Nationally, it's too early to tell uh, whether the Affordable Care Act has uh, improved that. We've seen some improvement in many things. For example, we're getting better at taking care of patients with sepsis. Uh, fewer patients are dying with, uh, with sepsis. Uh, locally, we can absolutely sh share that in the last couple years, quality has improved. There's been other uh, very positive uh, outcomes locally. A national service um, or, or survey by the Gallup Corporation um, asked the question, are you generally satisfied or dissatisfied with the total cost you pay for health care? And you can see from this that the number that are satisfied is slightly going down and the number that are dissatisfied are slightly going up. And so post-implementation, uh, fewer are satisfied with the cost of care. And one of the reasons for this is, as the Affordable Care Act has been enacted, health plans and the government are paying a little bit less of the cost of care, and individual patients have to pay more. And so we're feeling that in our pocketbooks. Uh, the next question was, um, uh, how people feel about the healthcare industry itself. And you can see uh, the dark green is very satisfied or positive. That has edged up a little bit since the law was enacted. And the number of very dissatisfied or negative has edged down. So generally people, they're not, still not thrilled, but there's a little bit of improvement in sentiments toward the healthcare industry. This is, I think, an important slide that I wanted to include. In 2000 or 2001, 19% of individuals surveyed indicated that they avoid or put off receiving medical treatment because of the cost of care. And one of the hopes of the Affordable Care Act was with more people that receive insurance, fewer people would, um, would stay away from their doctor's office because they have health care. And that has stayed about the same since the law has been enacted. Um, excuse me, let me go back to this. The premium costs have also increased. The total premium cost uh, for 2015 um, has gone up by about 4.2%. And I wanted to show an active slide. Can, can I ask, the, um, ask you to open this slide up? You can go to this website. If you want to do it at home, you can come up afterwards. We'll give you the, help, the, the site. It actually shows every single insurance company that sells insurance in California and what the trend is of their healthcare premiums. Can you launch that for me? And just click that on. This is an interactive slide. We're actually going to the internet right now. And uh, thank you very much. So if you wanted to go in, and I don't have the, um, the mouse in my hand, but if you wanted to see in comparison with 2015 and 16, you could go and every one of these dots represents an insurance plan and you could click it on. This large one is Kaiser Permanente. The even larger one is uh, Anthem Blue Cross. Well, you can see this, hold that on there. So for Kaiser Health Plans, the rate increase was 4.6%. Could you click on another one above that? Um, go to that one, Health Net, it's increased by 11.8%. Go to this one right up here, way up there. Uh, this is uh, the Moda Health Plan uh, by 15.8%. This is a public site that it intends to show um, the rate increase, but you can see overall that compared to 2011, it has been relatively modest. In 2014, there was a big jump up because insurance plans were concerned about this new plan, and so there were big increases and since that time in 15 and, and 2016, they have been more modest. But the average pace is around, around a little bit north of 4% increase per year for premium costs. Can you go back to the regular slides then? 
And the hope of the Affordable Care Act was again to bend the cost curve, excuse me, um, and this was to project in the, the, the dotted line and the actual line. So it hasn't been a dramatic improvement. It's been a very modest improvement in the premium costs that uh, people pay. What's also apparent since the Affordable Care Act was passed in 2010 and implemented in 2014, the percentage of workers enrolled in the health plan by their employers uh, that have a large deductible has steadily gone up. Now we have for small employers, 63% of small employers now expect their employees to pay a larger portion of the care with a larger deductible. In the exchange, sometimes the deduct deductible is as high as $6,000. And even for uh, very large employers, all firms, almost 40% of uh, workers now have to pay a larger portion of their care in co-pays and deductibles. Um, at the same time, the number of firms offering health benefits has decreased. And part of the reason is with the health care exchange, particularly small employers rationalize that, well, they, uh, an individual, our employees can buy health insurance affordably on the exchange. That was that diagram I showed before. And so fewer and fewer employer, employers are offering health insurance uh, for their employees. And you can see from the high in 2010 of 69%, it has fallen to 57% now. Um, and this is a, I think, a very good trend. It was encouraged by the Affordable Care Act, and that is wellness programs. So we now see that over 50% of employers offer a, uh, a health assessment for their employees, and um, uh, also a biometric screening. Our organization does that, and we offer a discounted premium if our employees, we're a hospital, but if our employees will participate in our wellness program, participating in a biometric screening, and then being encouraged to see their physician, and, and we even have healthcare coaches that call um, we feel that this is the right thing to do. So our employees get a discount on their premium, and we also hope that they'll receive better care, uh, preventive health care as a result. One of the things I mentioned earlier, this uh, shows it dramatically, is um, this is the average increase. As I said, it's increasing about 4%. Hospitals have gone up a little bit here, but prescription drug prices have really skyrocketed. Even generic uh, drug prices have gone up, an average of about 10%. And so this now becomes a political issue. Uh, why is that? Why are drug costs going up? We're already spending far more than other countries, and so this has become an issue. And there's nothing we can really um, uh, do about this short term, but this is a factor of, of increasing the cost of health care. We had hoped that the Affordable Care Act would result in um, patients enrolled in the health plan finding primary care physicians, and the forecast was that emergency room use would go down. And the theory was logical. If everybody has insurance, or most people do, and they have a physician, they will go less often, less frequently, to an urgent care center or an emergency room. But we've seen, and this is for our health system, but we see it throughout, it has steadily increased particularly urgent care. Look at that. Uh, it annualized its over 70,000 visits uh, just in western Ventura County for our four urgent care centers. So this might suggest that patients are not able to see their physician as quickly. It might suggest that there are too few primary care physicians, and Dr. Stan will talk about that. We also see that emergency room use, in California at least, has gone down for the uninsured, obviously, but look at the Medi-Cal number. The Medi-Cal has expanded, and therefore, the number of people coming to the emergency room tend to have that particular type of insurance. And that may be why it's driving uh, those numbers as we go forward. Now, impact on providers. Providers include hospitals, physicians. This graph uh, is a simple graph, but it really uh, speaks volumes. 
The revenue projection, that is what the government plans to increase for us, Medicare and Medicaid, we anticipate that we will receive over the next many years an increase of 0.5% increase per year. And other insurance plans are becoming more and more resistant to make up that difference. While the health care costs are going up by over 4%, Medicare is increasing by 0.5%. And therefore, the expense line is increasing at a more rapid pace than a revenue line. So what do we do about it? Well, we eat our Wheaties and we bend the cost curve. So um, health care, in my view, is improving in quality. It's improving in service. But we have to find ways, and we in our health system have implemented a program where we are reducing our total costs by $25 million over the next two years. Had we not done so, um, we would be in a situation where our expenses would continue to climb and we'd be in a loss position instead of a profit position. We're not crying on anybody's shoulder. This graph could be a similar graph for physicians' offices whose overhead continues to go up, but the revenue does not. And so efficiency measures, and we're getting more sophisticated uh, as we go along to find ways where we can improve quality, improve patient satisfaction while reducing the cost of care. And that's what we have to do as an industry. I'm going to go through these rather quickly. This just shows that um, more than half of physicians in uh, the United States are still accepting new patients. That was a concern uh, that they would close their doors. That's not actually true. Um, we're finding that um, um, the, uh, about 67% of physicians still have their practices open. Uh, we find that about six out of 10 primary care physicians are seeing more Medicaid patients. Um, and uh, that was a question mark, so they're seeing Medicaid patients. Um, but most providers report there's been no change in their ability to provide care. In other words, the Affordable Care Act has not affected it either way. It's an individual thing. These next set of slides are kind of fun uh, during the political campaigns, and we're not political on either side. Uh, I'm just sharing the slides. But when asked physicians their opinion, whether the Affordable Care Act um, was a positive thing or a negative thing, Democrats say very positive. Independents tend to be negative, and Republicans say it was very bad, okay? So it's, again, it still is a very politically charged issue, and it's not so much if you're um, a Democrat or Republican or independent, it's a philosophy of how much or how little government should be involved in health care. That really is what the slide is saying. Um, other slides uh, that are of interest, again, um, about um, uh, w whether uh, the Medicare expansion has provided an increase of quality. Um, there has been, it's, it's kind of been mixed. 23% uh, say no, 36% say yes and um, most were unsure, and it'll take some time for this really to be, to ferret out. Um, again, a, a quality a slide for Democrats, 63% say very positive, and only 18% of Republicans, that was true for physicians and nurse practitioners, maybe not surprising. And um, so on the cost of care, um, most, believe it has had a slightly more a negative impact because again physicians are feeling that their the cost of care is increasing they're feeling that burden their overhead is increasing but the revenue has not increased and uh, finally is are people overall satisfied with practicing medicine gratefully um, about uh, the, the same number of physicians uh, regardless of party line about 80 to 85 percent are satisfied and nurse practitioners are satisfied. I'm not going to turn the time, speaking of physicians, one of my very favorite physicians and favorite people, Stan Froschwag.
Thank you. What a pleasure it is to be here this evening. I appreciate the opportunity to bring you up to date as to what's going on clinically at Community Memorial Health System. You know, I've heard Gary talk uh, probably dozens of times on this topic. And I don't understand why every time I learn something new, even though I've heard similar discussions. So let, let me uh, go over a couple of items. First of all, I'm the chief medical officer, which means I'm uh, uh, an employee of the hospital who uh, provides a communication enhancement between physicians, the administration, and the hospital at large. And so I work daily in uh, the hospital caring for the needs of uh, patients and physicians and, and our administration. I also am a family doctor and have been so for the past 39 years here in Ventura. And I continue for a couple half days a week still to see patients, which I find to be very valuable in making certain that I have a sensitivity to the needs of all those involved. So first question, what should a community hospital be? Well, we know that um, we are not a transplant hospital like a UCLA or Cedar sinai We don't uh, treat trauma like Ventura County Medical Center does uh, with major traumatic uh, experiences. And we also don't treat rare and experimental treatments for cancers. What we do, though, is despite the changes that we have seen that have tr affected medicine and the delivery of healthcare to our patients, changing so dramatically, and the insurance increases, the costs, the electronic health records, I'll tell you from my perspective and many of my colleagues, these are very exciting times because I believe we're in the golden age of medicine. We are now able to provide care to our patients that simply didn't exist when I started to practice uh, many years back. So what, what do we do? Well, I'm going to speak about our specialty service, our outreach. I'll be speaking about our residency training program and the wonderful academic center that we've become. I'll talk about the electronic health records, both pros and cons, and describe how involved we are in the partnerships that we provide. First of all, I want you to appreciate a fact that uh, we provide advanced services that are very consistent with the services you'll see at places like USC, UCLA, Cedar sinai but they're here and local. The first thing I want to emphasize is brain surgery. For many years, people would travel down to LA for brain surgery, and that is completely unnecessary because we have a few young physicians who are expert, recently trained in the most advanced techniques, and we can provide those critical care. As a matter of fact, if you look right here, do you see this brain here? Right there, there's a, an unusual looking sign in the brain. That's an, a meningioma, a tumor of the brain, happens to be my patient. So after we dis, uh, the patient's wife said that he was having trouble focusing and his personality seemed to change, we got a brain scan, found the meningioma, and I consulted Dr. Dorsey, who is our, one of our neurosurgeons, and we went ahead, gave the patient some medication to decrease the swelling, and then a couple days later took him to the operating room where I assisted Dr. Dorsey and marveled at his exquisitely sensitive technique and his preciseness, and we removed that tumor that night after about nine hours in the operating room going on to about midnight. I left late at night, wished his wife well, told him everything will hopefully go well, and came back the next morning expecting to see him on a breathing machine, a ventilator, but instead when I walked into the intensive care unit, he was sitting in a chair next to the bed, and the first thing he said to me is, I'm hungry and I want to go home. <laughs> I will tell you, I marveled because, as you might imagine, I don't do much brain surgery, and, and this was an amazing case. But I, I wanted to illustrate that, and I won't tell you that all cases are this happy. This is not a kind of cancer that spreads, but this was absolutely amazing. In addition to that, we do treat cancer, and we have an oncology center, a cancer center, the Community Hospital Coastal Communities Cancer Center, where we have uh, oncologists who are cancer specialists, we have radiation specialists, 
And we also have oncology or cancer surgeons who operate principally on cancer. So we have the facilities here that provide all that in our very own community. I, I often marvel when I see uh, patients leave the community, go elsewhere, and either get identical services in LA or, quite frankly, farther away, and yet uh, have outcomes similar or identical to our patients, or sometimes, unfortunately, not as good as the care that we give. So you see that instrument. That's a, racket, a rapid arc uh, radiation machine that allows us to pinpoint the radiation to precise areas, avoiding areas that are more superficial, but focusing on areas that are deeper. Quite, quite impressive, actually. In addition to that, we have, for well over 30 years now, um, provided bypass surgery, open heart surgery, and valve replacements here at Ventura Community. And it's really quite amazing because doctors Bushnell and Tedesco have been with us for decades. They're highly respected, very talented, with incredible outcomes. And actually, we could compare our outcome statistics to anywhere across the country, uh, which often people don't fully appreciate. They also act as backup for our interventional cardiologists. So when a cardiologist is doing a procedure that is high risk but is quite acceptable and, as a matter of fact, encouraged, why they act as backup in case we have to do an open heart procedure. We also have electrophysiology. This is the expert on the electrical system of the heart. And I'll tell you, we've had people in the community who've had incredible outcomes. Uh, example, one of my colleagues um, went down to LA to have electrophysiology. This was about eight years or so ago. Wasn't helped, ended up coming to Stanford where he had a treatment, wasn't able to be cured there. And finally, his atrial fibrillation was controlled by Dr. Ishu Rao. And uh, we also have Jonathan Lukes, uh, uh, electrophysiologist here in town now. And, um, and they are expert in regulating the heart. Sure enough, when he went to Dr. Rao, his arrhythmia was completely cured. And he's hiking in the mountains and very active and now enjoying life a lot more. We also happen to have interventional cardiologists. And these cardiologists are doing incredible procedures nowadays. To give you a sense of that, you, most of you know about cardiac coronary stents, where we put a, we used to do dilations, and now we'll put little metal instruments in the arteries to keep them open. I'm very sensitive and familiar to this because my brother had it done just a year ago at Community Memorial Hospital. I had him come up from Tarzana and said, uh, you need to go to a good hospital for this. And I don't think they have any in LA, so let me have you come up here. Uh, by the way, he routinely, prior to that procedure, rode 100-mile century rides on his bicycle and is back doing that again. I usually meet him in my car at the top of Mount Pinos, <laughs> but I don't do that. In addition to cardiac stents, which we've been doing for many years, we now have a new procedure called the cardio MEMS, where through a little vein in the leg, we can pass up a tiny little instrument, just not more than, a, than about a half a centimeter, and put it in the right side of the heart and can measure now the pressures in the heart. And we can pick up on impending congestive heart failure. If you don't know what that is, that's when the body, the heart doesn't pump adequately and the body starts to accumulate fluid and you can have difficulty breathing. Well, this little tiny device, which you pick up the signals when you hold a pillow with an electronic device in it that then transmits through the internet to the cardiologist's office, and we can pick up on congestive heart failure impending days and even weeks before that occurs. This, of course, as you might imagine, will prevent visits to the emergency room as well as admissions to the hospital. We need to bend that cost curve by preventing people from coming in too excessively. In addition to that, we have a device now called the Watchman. And the Watchman is a new device where, you know how people get atrial fibrillation, you can't not know about it, because it's on television all the time. They're talking about their Coumadin and their, and their various other oral new medications where you don't have to measure that. Well, this device is put in also by an interventional cardiologist, and it will plug a little uh, appendage in the right atrium 
And that plugging of that appendage, also through a little vein in the leg up into the heart, why that will prevent a clot from forming when you have atrial fibrillation. And people who have been taking anticoagulants for years will be able to stop taking them because the clot formation will not occur. Again, these are things that are developing. And even more amazing to me, I'm not sure if you know what an atrial septal defect, but that's a hole in the heart. And we can now close that without open heart surgery. We can run a little device across the heart and plug that hole between the atria. We're not doing it with the ventricle yet, but we are doing it with the atria. Now, I've told you about some of the incredible techniques that we have at the hospital. And if you've got two or three more hours, I can go into more detail. But because we have to move along, I I'm happy to talk to you about that afterwards. The four walls of the hospital are important, but more important is where you live. So we come and reach out to every corner in Ventura County, providing our community with the services necessary. And as you can see from this, we have Breast Imaging Center. Out in Santa Rosa Valley, we have a clinic, one of our Center for Family Health clinics. Grossman's is located in Ventura and in Oxnard, as well as our Center for Wound Healing. I just spoke with a gentleman who has been traveling to Thousand Oaks who lives in Ojai for his care at a wound care center. We have hyperbaric chambers as well as um, some of the finest wound care physicians you could possibly meet. I have sent many patients to them, and I am so grateful because prior to our wound care center opening, wound care has been suboptimal to say the best, and I can speak from that from decades of, uh, of, of need. So we're doing wonderful now, and my patients love Dr. Tessman, the medical director. Our urology clinic is incredible, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Midtown Medical Group in just a few moments. We have so many other outreach opportunities. Most of you already heard about the speaker series that Mike Ellingson was referring to, and this helps educate our community, reaches out to the corners of our community. We have these presentations in Oxnard, Ventura, and up to Ojai as well. In addition to that, we have dietary services that are outpatient for our uh, population. We have flu vaccines. We have um, palliative care outreaches, which is the care that's necessary when people don't want excessive intervention by medical means. We'll support them. We'll provide them with the kind of uh, medication necessary to keep them comfortable, and it's really a marvelous service that actually very few communities have, but we are on the forefront of that. Let me talk about something that I find most exciting, health aware, and if you're not aware of it, you really should be. Now, this slide is interesting, and I can tell you it's slightly old because there's a sixth category called uh, stress aware. I don't know how many of you appreciate it, but stress affects every aspect of our health including our immune system. A lot of people will ask me when they come to the office, well, well, I don't understand why I'm getting sick so much. I can tell you about probably 80 plus percent of the time it's a result of that person not being aware that they've been under excess stress, sleep deprivation, or exhaustion, just plain fatigue. So our immune system is critical. Everyone here can go online, go to the Health Aware site right here, and you can take a seven minute test this will give you insight into where you might have some risk factors. And then there is a number to call, and we can direct you to the appropriate physician, primary care or specialist, who would be able to help you diminish your risk as it is related to these various areas. And, and that probably would do you more good than probably anything else I could tell you. So, you know, Stop me if you think I'm getting a little excited about this next part. But I have to tell you, uh, w things have changed in Ventura in ways I actually never dreamed that they would. We now have residency training programs, GME, Graduate Medical Education. We are now training doctors. And it's, it's for many reasons. We're now starting our fourth year, our fourth wave of young doctors coming to train at Community Moral Health System. And they are DOs, doctors of osteopathy. And I like to explain to people that DO and MD get identical and equivalent training. The only difference is that the DOs get 
hands-on musculoskeletal uh, adjustment training that we as MDs do not get. I kind of regret that, quite frankly. I wouldn't mind learn acupuncture, but I'm not going to throw that in. Now, there are, what are the benefits? Well, as you all know, and, and if you don't know, I'm sure you have friends who know, that it's hard to find a doctor, especially a family doctor or an internist. I get asked all the time if I could refer people to a good family doctor. It's not easy. Well, we're growing our own now. And with the vision of Dr. Sam Small, who initiated our residency training programs, and the wonderful support of Gary Wilde and the administration, our board of trustees, we've launched on this incredibly ambitious effort. We have all the residents supervised, both in the hospital and in the clinic, by tenured, seasoned physicians. They raise the quality of care. I cannot tell you the change in the feeling at the hospital. Everybody is excited. The doctors that have been practicing a particular way now realize, hey, I can pass my knowledge along, and they get excited about medicine again, excited about taking care of patients. It's something that is palpable. You can feel it, and I, I just have to tell you, it's incredible. You have two set, at least two sets of eyes now looking at you, and things that I used to do reflexively, because I've been doing it for so many years, suddenly I have to think through the steps of why I'm doing what I'm doing, because I'm explaining it to a young doctor. They make me reconsider things occasionally, too, because they're trained in medical schools with the latest techniques as well, at large medical centers very often. So this is an ambitious uh, opportunity. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Midtown Medical Group in just a moment. Specifically, we have four family practice residents starting this uh, July, eight internal medicine specialists, four orthopedic surgeons, and three general surgery residents. We have 36 residents right now. We're going to a total of 50 residents come this July. And I've got news for you, they are busy as can be. Here is our last class. Isn't that a nice looking young bunch? They get, why is it that they get younger every year? I don't understand that. Yeah, we, I'm sure we're taking them from you know, junior high now. <laughs> so here they are in the hospital, training with our senior medical staff who has been there for decades and who are guiding them in all the specialties. In addition to that, and as exciting is now we are bringing them into the outpatient setting. Family physicians need to spend a lot of time in the office because that's where they're typically go going to care for people, even though we have them trained in the hospital. Our internists train here now, and just a week ago, we had our grand opening of our new residency training clinic. We are, by the way, willing to take local patients, new patients, so anybody is able to call up and become a patient here. This is the faculty, meaning that these are the doctors who are helping train these young family doctors and internists. The orthopedists and the surgeons are mainly inpatient, spend very little time in the office, do most of the work in the hospital. You might see a familiar name there. This is the waiting room for the new clinic, and it's absolutely beautiful. The reception was great. We had lots of people come. The exam rooms, I feel so spoiled. I came kind of from an older office, and I'm thinking, oh my God, all this room, all, everything's bright and fresh, and smells like a new car. It's wonderful, I love it. And the staff are incredible. Well, we're coming into the 21st century now, kicking and spitting and everything else, but we now have electronic health records, and let me tell you, uh, it has its pros and cons. I am an electronic health record champion, but I will tell you, it causes problems for doctors who have trouble with change. It causes problems with doctors who are used to doing things on paper in an old-fashioned way. And it causes trouble with patients sometimes, too, because the doctor's trying to work through that a record and not always looking the patient in the eye anymore. That's a problem in connection. But I will tell you, anybody here who arrived in a horse and buggy, you let me know, okay? Because that's still available, but very few of us make use of that older technology. We're moving ahead, we're progressing, and the benefits are actually incredible. I can do my electronic health records from home, from the office, from in the hospital, access my patients. Today I get a message from the office, Mrs. So-and-so is having further problems, what should I do? Oh my God, I, 
I'd have to be proximal or by phone. I see the whole record uh, remotely. It's an, an incredible experience. And by the way, medication alerts. So I tried to prescribe a medication to an antibiotic to a patient a couple weeks ago. What happened? Boom. You know this patient had a medication similar to this. Uh, are you sure you want to prescribe that? And they had a reaction with that prior one. I had to rethink it. I had a long discussion with the patient and went forward appropriately. But that is something we haven't had before. And those records allow us to do that. It's really amazing. Now, I went out to dinner last week with a friend, and she was so excited because she goes to one of our centers for family health, and she says, yeah, I got an email, and it said you have, you have labs. And so she said she went online through our portal, took a look, and she saw her most recent labs that had just been drawn a couple days prior. Now, don't get me wrong. That this is not perfect yet. We're still refining this. But I was very encouraged to hear that from her last Saturday night at the, uh, at the dinner. Well, one of the most exciting aspects of this, and, and I can't overemphasize um, this, and that is we now have over 200 doctors sharing an electronic health record. What does that mean, sharing? When I send my patient to the gastroenterologist for a consultation for colonoscopy, they don't have to ask me for records. They have the records already, because the moment they register in their office, they can see all my records on that patient for the last 30 years. Now, that's incredible. And guess what? When the colonoscopy is performed, I get a little task alert. It says, I saw your patient. Colonoscopy looks good. I look in the record. I can see the pictures of the colonoscopy. That's incredible communication, and that's prompt and timely. In fact, this morning, I saw a patient with diabetes who I had sent to the endocrinologist for helping control that diabetes. He said, I'm not sure exactly what, the, what medications are, but they changed a little bit. I looked in the record. There were her results. She had increased the uh, Lantus a little bit and increased the oral medication a little bit, switched the nighttime ad uh, administration of the Lantus to the morning, and the patient's already feeling better. The ability to do that is incredible, and most of you will recognize these people. Uh, Dr. Herman and Birdwell are in uh, Wellspring. So these are primary care doctors, specialists, Centers for Family Health, Midtown Medical Group, cardiology associates just decided to come on board, which is amazing. I didn't put uh, Dr. Westhoff, who is the endocrinologist I consulted, and we have obstetricians and orthopedists doing this as well. This is now, we've hit a tipping point. We're seeing more and more people participating in our electronic record. And we have something called an HIE that we call DB Motion that allows us to connect to other electronic records. And we're in discussions and doing that right now. In fact, I had lunch this week with uh, the medical director of Clinicas del Camino Real. They, have a, they want to connect up to us, which means we'll have a whole other system able to exchange information and care of our patients that we all share. Uh, who are our partners? And, and, and I have right here, we, we realize that we're not in this alone. And in order to provide the best care to all of you, we need to partner with people. So Clinicas del Camino Real, who have been here for many years, Davida Dialysis, Kaiser Permanente is a large partner of ours, and we have a wonderful working relationship. Primary Medical Group, headed by Dr. Ed Bamman, and his five clinics, four in Ventura, one in um, Oxnard, and now an urgent care center in Ventura, is connected with us and also a partner of ours. Amazingly, we have done something incredible uh, with an enormous help by our uh, outreach marketing person, uh, Megan O'Neill, has connected us to numerous skilled nursing facilities and numerous um, home health agency is in assisted living agencies. And this allows us now, when my patient in the skilled nursing facility needs a blood test, it used to be done in LA. Good luck in me trying to get a hold of that result. It's now done at community because we've reached out and provided an incomparable service to those skilled nursing facilities. CVU and even VCMC, Ventura County Medical Center, we are now having surgical and orthopedic residents rotate for their training in a trauma center. Now, I've told you about our technology and all the fancy equipment and the specialists and everything, but quite frankly, our greatest resource are our nurses. Tomorrow is Nurses Day, for those of you who do not know, so make sure you give a nurse a hug. And uh, 
and I will tell you our hospital staff, nursing staff, and our physicians are really what makes us as great as we are in addition to all the technology that we have. We've extended this to our community to nearly a half a million patient visits throughout Ventura County, and that's really impressive to be able to reach all those people, but we only are able to do it because of our concerted and unified effort. I'd like to uh, turn the uh, podium back to uh, Gary Wild, and thank you. The stand indicated that our most valuable assets are our employees and our physicians. It's true. We're the only private community hospital, not-for-profit hospital in this region which means that we have no corporate overhead. We're owned by us. We don't have any stockholders, but we have stakeholders. So in our annual meeting, we like to give an update and a, um, of who we are. Uh, again, first of all, our, our people. We have a, a foundation boards, two of them that we work with, a board of trustees, uh, 23 individuals who serve without any compensation, who devote tens of hours uh, every uh, year on our behalf. Our employees, we have over 2,400 employees, nearly 2,500. We have a spiritual care team and volunteers, over 400 volunteers. That is what makes community, makes community moral health system what it is. Nursing, as Stan has already mentioned, we have incredible nurses, gifted nurses. We have partnerships uh, with um, other organizations to educate people. Uh, we have a new, new chief nursing officer who is focused on how do we really develop our nursing staff following the Institute of Medicine uh, guidelines from 2010 and assessing, pro, uh, uh, assessing progress. And I'm not going to go through everything, but we're doing all these things to make the practice of nursing uh, the ultimate, uh, the most state-of-the-art, both high-tech and high-caring. That's the focus that we uh, make. We're hiring new graduates from uh, our local colleges. We're training them, much like we are with medicine, and we're focusing on helping our clinical staff become board certified, and, um, and, and that's, that percentage is increasing over time. So we have the most outstanding nurses that I've ever worked with. Clinical and safety training. We have an annual program, a marathon, of how to teach our employees to keep themselves safe in the workplace, how to keep patients safe, how to reduce infections and the vectors for it. Um, and uh, this is a, a fun event every a year, but we really focus on how can we continue to improve to keep our patients um, uh, safe and our employees safe. We partner with uh, Ventura College and Cal State Channel Islands for uh, an associate director, uh, associate nursing program, and also a baccalaureate program. Um, every year, Barbara Meister, and Barbara, you're here. I'm going to have you stand. Barbara, could you please stand uh, through Barbara's generosity? Um, we. Um, she, uh, through us, but it's her generosity, provides scholarships for uh, nurses to go back to school who otherwise would not have that ability. And uh, it's now uh, probably 20, 30 people who are in the pr practice of nursing because of her generosity. Barbara, thank you so much. Uh, Peter Gall was a, a dear friend. He passed away a few years ago. He loved animals. And so in honor of him and in honor of his wife, we started the Peter Gall Pet Therapy Program. And these are uh, dogs that are certified in every way to behave themselves. They're disease free, but they come and they gladden the hearts of patients who will um, welcome a visit. And it's amazing what this program does. It's just an example of a high touch uh, program that we have. One of the uh, very special um, gifts that our community has is the gift of music. Sandra and Jordan Labby have donated funds uh, to the hospital through the building program, but they wanted to do something special. And so within the building, the main lobby of the hospital that you'll see, which will be completed about a year from now, we have uh, a grand piano 
and we're going to provide music uh, in our organization, in our hospital, and this is in honor of them. And I thought it was such a wonderful tribute to them. Uh, they love music. They wanted to bring music into the healthcare arena, and so we're going to do that. Quality is on everybody's mind. Uh, today in the paper there was a report that behind heart disease and cancer, the number one cause of death in the United States was mistakes happening in hospitals. Now, hospitals would dispute that study, um, but the point is that we need to be very diligent in preventing avoidable mistakes. And so we focus on um, outside organizations that help us. We're ISO 9001 certified. We try continuously to ask, ask and answer the questions, how can we do it better? How could we be safer? How can we save more lives? And every year we get a little bit better and better about it. Part of that, the, the, the part of the need to do that well is to be humble and to create tension in the organization. When I say that, we don't want anyone to be defensive about a mistake. And we want to be humble enough and have tension enough to cause us to recognize that we made an error so that we never make that same error again. And so we have at the board level, at the medical staff level, this approach, appropriate humility and tension so we constantly recognize our shortcomings and then do something about it and educate others of how we can avoid that error. The results have been dramatic. <coughs> Excuse me, the, um, the federal government has a program that looks at hospital-acquired conditions, or HACs. And hospitals are penalized now a significant amount of money if the number of hospital-acquired conditions is higher than an acceptable level. We, um, in 2015, we were very pleased that we had a level, lower is better, uh, 3.07, but we were not satisfied. We wanted to continue to find ways that we could avoid infections, that we could avoid these kind of problems, wound dehiscence and so forth, and we're constantly looking at where we, we go. And we're significantly below uh, the national average and want to make that number lower. Uh, these were the scores, and here we are um, last year. We have wonderful hospitals in the area. Some were above the, the threshold and got penal, penalized, and a few of us gratefully were below. Every one of the hospitals in the area wants to reduce and reduce and reduce preventable harm and we work and share with each other how to do so. We also compare ourselves with the very best hospitals in the United States, the top quartile, in other words, the top 10%. And we compare very favorably with mortality rate, that is, how many patients die in our hospital versus who was expected to die based on their prognosis. We do extremely well. We're in the top 10% uh, of hospitals in the country. Also, this hospital-acquired condition, again, very, very good. And uh, we also, from an efficiency standpoint, once somebody goes home, we don't want to see them again. Not that because we don't love them, but we want them to stay well. So we measure and monitor the number of patients that come back within a month. And we try to reduce that number wherever we can. And when somebody comes back, we try to learn what would have prevented this readmission. We have teams of people that do this through a program called intensive case management. Um, and these are just some additional um, studies at uh, OHI. Patient satisfaction is also very important to us. We strive to do all that we can. We uh, do better at, than the national average on the question, would you recommend us? We do very well on that. The OHI campus does extremely well. Some of the top scores in the country from our Ojai campus, particularly in communication with doctors and with nurses. We uh, could pat ourselves in the back appropriately. We have a number of, uh, we continue to win the Star Award and we are a center of excellence and Blue Rimmer Awards across, the, the, uh, across many uh, clinical programs. We're very proud of that. But what it really comes down to is we have an saying in our organization that we're here for only two reasons, for ourselves 
uh, for, for ourselves and the median employees and for our patients, and we strive continuously to improve. Financially, since you are our stakeholders, we want to give a very transparent viewpoint. Here's our balance sheet. Total assets of $815 uh, million, um, and um, our net assets of $381 million. And we're very proud of this. It's a very solid balance sheet. Our income statement, uh, we're operating at a high level. We had uh, net margin gains of $31.1 million, an operating EBITDA for the accountants of about, uh, about 12%. A net margin of just under 10 percent, and um, our investment income went down last year with the stock market going down, as most of your portfolios saw. So far, it's come back up uh, pretty nicely, um, but we had a nice uh, net net profit of um, 28.9 million dollars, and again, this uh, it compares very very favorably with hospitals in uh, the country and in the state. So our statistics, I'm not going to bore you with all these. There's some that are kind of fun. Um, pharmacy prescriptions, 3.5 million. The one I like is uh, 2.5 million pounds of laundry. We have our own, uh, our, it's almost like a city down below the hospital in the basement. We have our own laundry with a, um, a room that's about half the size with a huge ironer. If anybody wants to take a tour sometime, it might be fun. But um, these are our statistics. And uh, that's what we wanted to present. Charity care, we provide a lot of charity care. One interesting thing, again, about the Affordable Care Act, there's going to be less charity care. Why? Because more and more people have insurance. But we still provided um, $1.2 million of, um, of care to our community for people who could not afford the care. Uh, as a not-for-profit organization, that's our role. And at the Ojai campus, 287000 um, we're building a new hospital, capital improvements. Uh, this is a recent picture. We're also building a, a parking structure. This will be completed in July of this year, the parking structure, the new hospital about a year from now. And um, I've toured a lot of hospitals, and I, again, I don't want to be boastful. This is among the very best design hospitals I've ever seen. We're looking forward to it. It has the most advanced equipment in the world for imaging, operating rooms, uh, the intensive care unit, and we're able to bring this to the community. This is a, a very significant improvement from what we have right now. Uh, these are just some sides of the, uh, the construction. When completed, we'll have the new hospital that we're calling the Ocean Tower. The existing hospital, the Mountain Tower, will adaptively reuse this building for things and we have an existing parking structure and then the brand new parking structure where patients and visitors will come and the elevators and the stairwell will come right down here. This is a very short walk into the front of the hospital. So we're really looking forward to that. Again, the most advanced equipment that we have available in the world, that's the high tech. The high touch part, these are amazing people. We have Susan Petty and Richard Ament and uh, Barbara Hirsch, who are the chairman of our, these are great artists, and they have now procured over 300 pieces of original art from artists in our local area that will be put on the walls and gladden the hearts of our patients in the new hospital. We've done a similar program at our Ojai campus as well. Um, we provide tours every Wednesday, and anybody who would like to take a tour of the campus, uh, the uh, Come up afterward, we'll give you the contact information. Uh, we have hard hats and vests and goggles that you need to wear. And uh, for those that like to see engineering and the conduits, now's the time to do it because the walls are closing up quickly inside and it's marvelous. I think you'll be very impressed with the, the new building. At the Ojai campus, we have completed uh, the acute care hospital. Uh, it's a beautiful campus now that it reflects uh, more appropriately uh, what we're proud of at Ojai and the architecture there. We're strongly considering a continuing care center, and next week we'll finally decide on that, but the Ojai campus is also very important to us. Centers of Family Health, we have, I think, 14 of these now that see about 300,000 patients per year, everywhere from Camarillo, Fillmore, Ojai, and throughout 
um, primary care physicians as well as specialty care. So we're your community hospitals, you are our stakeholders, and this is our report. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you.